a really unique look at audio engineering on the world stage. We're going to peel back that onion. Uh, we got a brand new ITL. We missed you, but we're back. It's been Sato's place. Yay. What's up, guys? Glad to see you again. Good to be back, right, Herb? Absolutely, absolutely. You know, I, I, um, I don't introduce you anymore. I don't have to. I, I, I miss saying, and I'd like you to meet my wingman, Herb Trowick. Remember hey, the nice first, to meet, first nice ten episodes I used to do that? Nice to meet you guys. Uh, now it's like, now it's Herb. Hey, I'd like you to meet this dumbass that's on the show. His name's Dave, but you, you know him. <laughs> Well, listen, if you feel the need to introduce me, I'll let me know and I'll play along. <laughs> no, I was thinking about that the other day. I was reflecting on, on the, this blessing and gift that our audience has given us yeah. and how, 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 how we've kind of grown, you know. And, and I it, mean, we're, this is, I think, episode 59, which is, like, incredible. I know. Um, I know. We, we did pretty good. We had a string about one a week for, like, a year, didn't we? We did. We do, we do. Yeah, we but they, some... they make it worth it. That's why it's really cool to do it. Yeah, it really is. Uh, I want to give a shout out to Alex the Kid. His website is incredible. I, I've been uh, been really enjoying hanging out there. It's called Audio Corner with a K. Herb, Herb saw it the other day. Uh, check it out. I, I think you guys are going to like it. And keeping you up with, with some of our previous guests, Ken Scott, his book is out. Abbey Road to Ziggy Stardust. I want you to check that out. Uh, he f completes a lot of the, uh, some of the anecdotes he had on the show, they're, they're expanded and really cool. And then he's doing a live appearance March 20th at 7 p.m. at uh, Music Institute. And then uh, if you have any Pro Tools questions, go to our buddy G.I., go to his website at, at uh, IamGI.net. And that's about it for me today. Very cool. Uh, as usual, let's say hello to uh, our chat room man, Mr. Drew Adams. Drew, Drew. say hello. What did you <laughs> but now say hello, Drew. Say it again. Hi, there you go. Uh, palm palm Dalian. Uh, it's, it's Palm Dalian. It's just a couple beats behind, but it's so earnest and lovable. So that's what yeah. we love. Him. Palm Dalian, Alien. The anal probes were a big hit up there with the aliens. You can tell. I'm going to stay away from that a thousand feet. Yeah. So I live, uh, I, I live there, Palm Dalian. Like there you go. Uh, as always, say hello to our Vintage King family, our our man Chevy, and the. The Nira brothers, who we love so much, and yeah. it's good to see them. Um, you, you know, in doing shout outs, um, let's, what, we're, what we've talked about doing is we're going to add some things to our website. Uh, it's been a minute for us to sort of pay attention to it. There's a lot going on, which we will share with you shortly. Uh, but one of the things that we, we are going to add to it immediately is you can, f you can sign in and sign up for our mailing list. So go, go to pensadosplace.tv. You see it up on the screen right now. Um, and what you're going to see is we're going to evolve that starting very shortly into all kinds of different things that will give you up-to-date information, point to other kinds of things. I won't share with, it, with you everything yet, but, uh, uh, but we're going to reactivate that. So let's start with that and go do that. Um, we have a good ITL, a great guest. I also want to do a quick little shout-out. If you're not doing anything, you have some free time, you're bouncing around YouTube. I got a call from a buddy of mine in New York last week. Um, and, you know, we always talk about, and our guests always talk about, how much, besides the technical side of this, the inspiration <laughs> side, <laughs> the inspiration side is important, mm -hmm. correct? Um, if you get a chance, go to YouTube and pull up Bruce Springsteen appearing at the Apollo wow. last week. Um, here's a 62-year-old guy who literally climbed the rafters of the Apollo, hung off the ceiling, hung off the box, it was three hours. A friend of mine went there to the show, and it was like watching church. I mean, it was, you know, Hilfiger and Ben Stiller and Michael Douglas, and they were just in awe. And I just picked it up from a YouTube video. My buddy who went there said it was, so, it, it, so inspiration is important. And watch oh, a guy who fun. doesn't have to do that at 62 oh. years old just giving it and bringing it. That, so That venue has such history. I'm sure he felt well, that's the conversation I had, was that it seemed like he was inspired mm -hmm. to perform past himself. So, so also a shout out to a friend of mine, the chairman of the Apollo, Janelle Procope, who Absolutely. has just done an incredible job. Uh, this year alone, she had McCartney there, she had Sting, she had Bruce Springsteen. It's where President Obama sang the Al Green thing. She has absolutely revitalized that place. So it's a cool YouTube video to watch. But anyways, beyond that... Um, Excellent shout out. I think we... Um, 
why don't you introduce our ITO? Oh, okay. Um, we dropped by record plant and hung out with my buddy Dylan, um, who's he's got a new Black Eyed Peas. Well, he actually's got the new. Uh, he's done all the Black Eyed Peas records, but he's he's working on, on a record with Will. And uh, Dylan gave us some really good pointers. Check these out. Hey guys, something new today. We're uh, we're here at the record plant. Uh, big shout out to Rose and Sayoko. Uh, just spoke to Rose a moment ago. She's doing great. Sends her love to all you guys out there. Um, we're here with Dylan Dresdo. Dylan, thanks for coming and hanging out. Or I guess I'm hanging out at your spot. Dylan's here working <laughs> on the new Will I Am album. And Dylan, what you got? What you got in store for us? You talked about a couple of things on the phone you wanted to do. Yeah, I just wanted to show some people um, some good transition techniques that people can use transitioning from different sections of the song and even between songs on records. Cool. And you said this could you could actually use this for like if you're presenting something to a label like a bunch of demos or your own Absolutely. band demo, you could use it from yeah. song to song too. Absolutely. I mean, it kind of, you know, labels notice that stuff whenever you kind of up the ante with your demos. So they notice whenever your production's a little bit higher on that. And these, these are some of the techniques that I think are, you know, things you can apply to those situations. Cool. I want you guys to be nice to Dylan. He's taking his time to do this for us. So only flame him a little bit. Uh, go for it. <laughs> don't don't challenge the internet. That's foolish. But I'm gonna get out of here and let uh, and uh, and let Dylan take this thing over and show you guys some really cool stuff. Uh, by the way, uh, this is fully Pensada's place certified. This particular ITL. I love this guy. All right, guys. All right. So uh, I got a mix up um, of a song called Vampire Disco, which was uh, produced by. Uh, Zion Brock and Christian uh, Tesmer, and uh, it's a great pop song, but has to have a club feel because it's about you know being in a disco. So uh, let me just play a little bit of this for you, uh, just so you get an idea. It's a pop song, obviously, but it has to have a club appeal. So that's what we're working with. Won't somebody say? May I please have your attention? The quarantine. It's a vampire disco! They're gonna come out, I guarantee. But never before 11p. That place is a delicatessen. And the music, you're the fresh meat. Last time, I swear, my girlfriends took me there. And we danced to the hunger and the lust in the air. Okay, so you get an idea of what we're, we're dealing with here, and you can see the song already has some landscape to it. And what I kind of wanted to uh, walk you through is I get a lot of email questions from people asking me about transitions and how to set up sections and uh, some of the ways that I've done things in the past. Now, on this song, <clears throat> we wanted to really get your attention before the first verse came in, but the first verse is kind of creepy and mysterious. And a great way to do that is by doing a delay that goes into it, but we didn't want to just do it across the entire vocal part. So you can see right here, um, I'll zoom in a little bit, we've got this chorus part and the vocal sings, um, you know, uh, it's a vampire disco. Here's the solo part right here. It's a vampire disco! Now you hear that I just did the delay on the sco part um, the reason I did that is if you if you bring this out, like if I put it on everything here, and you listen to this track now, it, it's just all over the place. It's a vampire disco! Now in context it's even worse, because it's just a big jumbled mess whenever it comes in. It's a vampire disco! So basically all I did is I had it delay right back here on the sco part. On the analog side of things, back in the day, this was much more difficult to do. Pulling off a delay throw on analog, which was much, much more difficult, and the technology progressed, and it got a lot easier. Um, this is a 9K, an SSL 9K. 
So basically, the element that you'd want to do a delay throw on, you would bring up on this channel, and um, you could set your level here, and then what you would do is you would lift the large fader to mix button here, so that this large fader is no longer fitting your two mix. Essentially, you can't hear it anymore in your monitors. So then you could set your level accordingly, and then with automation on, you could just set, you, you would leave it cut, and then uncut it on the words that you wanted to do a delay throw. Alternately, you could just leave it open and just automate the large fader up accordingly to however much set, you know, you wanted to send it. Now, you could, there were other ways you could do this. You could use a small fader, or you could use, you know, even, even by automating some of the, uh, the aux sends and stuff like that. But, um, you know, this was the most common way that people did it because a lot of these SSLs were larger consoles. And when you had 100 channels, uh, it, it didn't really, you know, bug you as much, but you were wasting the resources. So in the DAW land, uh, it's a lot easier and we should be taking advantage of this. The other part is that if you did do a delay throw and there was one little thing you didn't like about it, to edit it was much more difficult than it is to edit whenever you're in a DAW. So something else that I tried here was uh, I was really trying to make this a little bit too epic up on the front. And on this first word, it's... Uh, I tried a reverse reverb technique, and basically, back in the day, what we used to do is, whenever we did this effect, we would usually work on like a two-inch, 24-track machine, and you would go to the end of the song, and then physically flip the tape over so that whenever you were playing it, it was playing backwards. Then you would take that and then feed it into a reverb and then record it uh, onto two empty tracks, and you had to make sure your documentation was good on your track sheets. Uh, a lot of, you know, guys and girls would actually solo the tracks they would record to to make sure that they didn't blast over something on mistake. But it was like, you know, one of the reasons why documentation was so important even whenever you were uh, doing some of those, those you know, techniques. Um, in the digital domain, it's a lot easier for us to pull some of this stuff off. And one of the things that I prefer to do is instead of doing the entire phrase, I just take the first syllable of the first word. And this kind of gives me a little bit more of a dramatic effect and more control over it. Um, so here we have the it's part, um, you can hear soloed here, it's, and then a quick and dirty way to do this, there's, there's multiple ways that you can do this in the digital domain. I'm going to show you one that's really quick and easy, and I encourage you to kind of um, experiment with different ways of, of achieving the same effect. Now if you look here, you can see I've got four vocals, and they're all relatively panned out to the sides. And so what I'm going to do is go ahead and do just mono reverb processing on them instead of sending this into a stereo reverb or anything like that. So I just basically create an edit, and then I drag this forward a couple bars, and then I have this room to play with with the verb part. So all I have to do here is go under my audio suite, go to reverb, and I'll use D-verb. This is Pro Tools 9. Uh, in Pro Tools 10, they've actually streamlined this process a lot quicker. Um, so I encourage you to try some of the newer stuff out as well. Um, I'm just using 9 because I was on an album with this rig and I didn't want to do the transition over to 10 yet. So um, the main parameter that I think you need to focus on is the decay time here. And you probably want it to be more than 10 seconds. If you overshoot it, it's better to kind of overshoot than to undershoot because you can always fade it in. Now that's going to change the intensity of your reverb, so you have to keep that in mind. And the more you experiment with this, the more that's going to become part of your instinct, and you'll know. So I'm going to go ahead and crank up the input because a lot of times the verb ends up being dipped in level quite a bit. And I'll do eh, about 14 seconds here. Now if you listen to this it's part, it's, it's nice and long. So I'm just going to go ahead and switch over to reverse this to get the reverse reverb effect going. And if you listen to it now, you're going to hear the build up. Now this is cool, but at the end you're also going to hear this little sure thing that I don't normally want, but it's okay for right now because one of the things that I want to do to make this even more dramatic is I'm going to apply a flanger to it, and a really decent one to do that's really quick and easy is just using meta flanger. You know, a lot of people have been using this for a long time, and just as it comes up is actually a good starting point. So I'm just going to leave it as is, and again, we're just processing mono fi audio files here. So I'll hit process, and you'll hear this get metallic and jet flangey. So that's pretty cool, but again, there's that little thing at the end that I don't like. So what I'm going to do is zoom in here, and just get rid of this whole part, which I don't need. 
and move this forward. But if I move it forward, you're going to see there's still a little space here. And I could probably fade this, but just to be on the safe side, I'm going to go ahead and move it forward manually a little bit and just kind of eye that in and then do my crossfade here. Now, if I play this, it sounds pretty damn cool. Check it out. It's a vampire disco! Now, here we have this cool thing that sets up this little part where the vocals come in for the first time in the song in, in a chorus, you know, environment. The problem with that is whenever I bring it in with the rest of the track, check this out. It's a vampire disco! So the problem there is it's really getting in the way of everything, and we're also kind of selling the vocal short because... That's the first time the vocal comes in and we're losing that impact. Plus, we've already got elements in this mix that the producer's already programmed, like the reverse cymbal that are already doing what I'm trying to kind of accentuate here. Now, listen to it without and you'll hear what I'm talking about. It's a vampire disco! So you can hear with this reverse cymbal that we've got going on up here, this little part. It's a it sounds a lot cleaner whenever those vocals come in for the first time. It makes a much better impact. And this is a great exclamation point going right into the verse. And when, when we have this nice, dark uh, delay throw that kind of trails off, it really sets up the, the verse in a nice way. Let's just do it one more time here. It's a vampire disco! So you can see, you know, it just didn't work that time. Now, when you try these things and they don't work, I, I don't think of them as failures because it really was a success. You tried something and it didn't work, so you move forward. If you hadn't tried it, you'd just be kind of, you know, selling yourself short sometimes. So without listening to it in context, it's difficult to really hear what's going on and how it's actually going to impact the song. Now, like I said, there's other ways to do it. I'm sure the Pensado students will you know, exchange dialogue of different ways to do reverse reverbs. You could send it from a bus to a verb, record that, bring it back. Um, there's a bunch of different ways to do this. And I encourage you to try those out and find out which way works best for you in certain areas. Another thing that I think is also important is that you remember that you don't just have to put a flanger on it. You can try a tremolo. You can try a panning effect. You can try a combination of them. And that's something that can kind of be unique to the song and the only person that can really determine if that's right is, is if you're happy with it as you or if you're working for a producer, uh, making sure that it's good for them. Now, if you've tried it and they don't like it, who cares? Just get rid of it. It's not that difficult for us to get rid of this stuff, whereas back in the day, if we printed this to analog, we burn up the tracks and we wasted resources that we wouldn't have had to have wasted you know, otherwise. So I think it's a good thing for you to kind of experiment and work with on quite a bit. You can also use delays instead of doing reverse reverbs. Um, you know, a good example of a reverse reverb is uh, the No Diggity song that Dre did with Blackstreet. Um, you know, a reverse delay effect, could, you know, there's a bunch of Led Zeppelin ones, you know, woman, woman, you need all that stuff. So try to think of ways that that can really work for you and don't just do just this. Expand on it and talk to other people and, and bounce ideas off of other people to come up with something that's more unique for you. Man, I want to thank Dylan. That was, uh, I was there and I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed watching it again. So thanks, Dylan. And thanks to Rose and Sayoko for making our, uh, uh, giving us such a warm reception there. Uh, today, I've got my buddy John Nettlesby with us. John is someone that, uh, confidant, friend, someone that uh, if, if I've got a problem, he's my first go-to call to make. John, welcome. Good to have you, man. Glad to be welcome, here. Welcome, bro. Good to uh, see you, man. Good John, you. Uh, John's going to teach us uh, and, and, and uh, give us some insight into a world that, that we might not normally see, uh, several worlds, actually. He's, he's done so many things and done all of them well and at such a high level. I really felt it was important to have him on the show so that you guys could could see how broad and 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 how many opportunities there are in our business, which I think is uh, timely right now. But uh, John just finished up Mary J. Uh, the last few Michael Jackson projects and records he's been a part of. So we're going to talk to him about that. 
uh, when we had the uh, when we had Alan Myerson on Howard Hewitt show me we talked about that song John wrote that song wrote the lyrics and, uh, with his partner and uh, that's still one of the best uses of reverb I've, I've, I've ever seen we're gonna talk about a little bit of that but let's jump right into it John it, um, ballads are kind of timeless I would say you know what I'm saying it's Absolutely. like the up tempos you, you can tell an up tempo from last week from right. an up tempo from this week but right. ballads have a pretty good shelf like uh, shelf life like sadly enough hearing Whitney's I will always love you I mean it's just so it tears you up every time you hear it but it still sounds fresh you know and, right. and, and your great ballads uh, some of the stuff you did with Mickey will show me also but some of the stuff you did with Mickey uh, um, um, if if I still love you, well, what was it? Was, that was the number one record. What was the, what was the first? The hit off the first album. Um, I got it written down. I didn't want to look for it, but I'll look for it. Uh, Ain't nothing in the world. Yes. God, that record is like. I want you guys to look up those two records. <laughs> I'm pointing to myself on the <laughs> mic. I want you guys to look up those two records because I think they're exemplary in terms of how to craft a ballad. Did, 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 did this stuff just come to you? I mean, it, it's a lot of hard work, you and Terry, right? right absolutely. Uh, shout out to Terry Coffey, mm -hmm. uh, my partner in crime at the time. Um, you know, again, like you said, with an up-tempo record, there's, a, there's definitely a time signature, right? If you mm -hmm. listen to uh, songs from the 70s that were up-tempo records, they definitely sound like you can definitely hear disco elements. Mm -hmm. You definitely can hear when, when everything went with the electronic drums, you know, mm -hmm. the Jeffrey Osborne, the 80s sound, mm -hmm. and then the 90s sound from an up-tempo perspective. But you hear a ballad from any given time period, you was like, a, you listen to the coast or whatever, those, those ballads translate, they, they, they stay current. Mm -hmm. So the checks are pretty nice too, huh? Those checks are really <laughs> nice, right? <laughs> yes, I mean, I'm sure Barry Manilow and, and Babyface are still eating yeah, every day. Diane Warren? I'm like, Oh, well, I am. Yeah, Diana. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's <laughs> the world's greatest, right? So, yeah, so, I mean, with Mickey Howard, again, the voice is so timeless. Mm -hmm. Howard Hewitt, the voice was so timeless. Keith Washington, the voices mm -hmm. were so timeless. Mm -hmm. What we did is just like, you know, okay, we want to make something that would sound like it's going to last forever. So you intentionally tried to make songs that you knew would yeah. last forever? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And how How many... Did you finish your, your answer? Did I cut you off? No, no. Uh, both of you guys help me here. It seems like most ballads, the lyrics are written by women, isn't it? Or am I wrong in that? Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know if that's necessarily correct. Um, I think it's the style of the artist. You, know, you take like a Brian or somebody else. I guess, I guess I'm so used to currently right now, Esther Dean and a lot of the hot... Well, I think proportionally there are more women artists out on the radio than male artists. There's there's just not oh, a see. lot of the, the proportion is different because the demand is different. Mm -hmm. But I, I I think there's a lot of males who write. Oh off. yeah, well I mean I, probably in today's world with Diane Warren mm -hmm. and and her rise to eminence. But you know back in the day uh, with Sammy Kahn, he was the greatest sure. lyricist. Uh, Hal David with Burt Bacharach, sure. and of course certainly wrote all of those songs for Dionne Warwick. And but all you wrote the lyrics to your guys, didn't you? In the Motown camp. Yeah. Know, with, I mean, there was just yeah, so yeah. many people yeah, yeah. who wrote. Uh, no, I wrote the, you know, at, at that time, romance was everything, right? Mm -hmm. Right? We were in a very romantic time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, too busy thinking about my baby. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll build your castle with a tower so high it reaches the moon. If that don't do, I'll try something new. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I got so much honey bees envy me. I mean, you know, <laughs> lyrics were, mm -hmm. you know, everything was romantic. Mm -hmm. Now everything is more, you know, swagged. The male today, it's just so swagged out and so, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, yeah. over-exaggerated. It's not cool you know, to be romantic. At all. Yeah. Yeah. Right, so the men, if a man writes a very sensitive lyric, he's yeah. sensitive. Right. You know, right. and it's that's why you have to really appreciate like a Neo or someone who has an ability mm -hmm. to Bring really come from a, you know, a, a gentleman's perspective. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, T-Pain mm -hmm. is a, is, is a mm -hmm. I think his success is based on the fact that he's a very romantic guy. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I'm in love with a stripper. Mm -hmm. You know, let, <laughs> right? Let, 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 me buy, let me buy your drink. Context. Let me context. buy your drink, right? Absolutely right. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. I, I, you know, in music today, you, you rarely hear love. For the guys they love, even if it's a stripper, he's in love. There's love there, right? Strippers need love. That's it. I'm sprung. 
right? Mm -hmm. uh, and we can, I can put you in a mansion somewhere in Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We can change the last name, ain't nothing but a thing. He's a romantic at heart, and I think that explains a lot of his success, is that he is, at the core, there's a romance mm -hmm. there. In a world that's this EDM, in a world that's like 130 beats per minute, do you think there's room for somebody to sneak in with a couple of really solid ballads right now? Well, let's look at Adele. That's you know, true. I mean, if we look at the real big, you know, the really big successes. What's the upper limit BPM for a ballad? What would you say a ballad ends at? 75? Yeah, probably. I would say, yeah. Mm. A good one, yeah. I would mm. say 75, about right, yeah. What do you think, Drew? Sounds about right. Yeah. 75, 72, in there. Yeah. The upper limit, I would say. Yeah, the upper limit. What's the lower limit, though? Well, you can do anything, right? The lower limit for the baby making music, the slower the better, right? Yeah. You know, that's a good question. I, I wonder what the slow. We'll look that up and bring that to you <laughs> soon. But the slowest ballad ever made, what would that be? You know, the Isley Brothers had that one uh, sensuality, right? Mm -hmm. No hi hats and none of that. And it's just like it's laying there. The song's like nine minutes long. And, you know, if you're in the act, mm -hmm. You know, it's like, don't disturb this groove, it's there, right? It's like, it, it's soft, it's slow, you can really take your time. On, on Ain't Nothing in the World, did you start, <coughs> you and Terry, did you guys start with a, a, a melody idea, or, or did you start with the track and then you put the melody on top of the track? Well, Terry came with this really incredible track, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you know, uh, one amazing thing about Terry Coffey, he could listen to, you know, whatever was on the radio, right, and extrapolate what was, what was really hip about it, right, encapsulate that, and then give you something where, you know, the melody's almost built in, it just, you just, it just comes to you. Right, I so I, you know, I'm listening to to the, the, the track and I'm going, okay, I know what key Mickey sings in, which is, you know, crucial mm -hmm. for a real singer singer and then uh, I know a little bit about her life so I'm able to you know translate that into something that, that mm -hmm. just worked but no Terry came with the music first and I just mm -hmm. it was an alley-oop mm -hmm. <laughs> what um, what 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 in terms of of production techniques what what advice would you give someone in today's climate in today's world who was born in the 90s, what, 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 what technical advice would you give them in terms of starting out on their first ballad? Okay, so ballad is, what, what, what's very important about a ballad as opposed to these up-tempo records is that you want to get out of the way of the singer, right? Mm -hmm. So from, from, a, from, a, from a production standpoint, you don't want to have a lot of instruments playing in the same frequency range that the singer is singing. Okay. Right? You want to open that up. So you want to have something that's really low and sonorous and like, you know, with the pads or something that's really high pitched, but it leaves that middle for the singer to sit there. Right? Mm -hmm. like I remember when Luther first came out, right? Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, it's, uh, a house is not a home, mm -hmm. right? Marcus Miller? Right. Nat Adderley Jr. Oh, Nat Adderley. Mostly. Marcus Miller as well, but the Dad Adderley Jr. arrangement. So here this piece of music is so sparse, it's like boom, tick, tick, boom, tick, tick, boom. A chair is still a chair, right? Mm -hmm. And there's just, nothing in there, just right? Breathing. Just, just space. breathing, right? Yep. So you leave enough room for the lyric right, the lyric to stand out. Mm -hmm. So what happens is, uh, you know, even like I said, was alluded to that Isley Brother record earlier, that sensuality, no hi-hats, right? So it's just this wide open mm -hmm. space, right? And again, mm -hmm. if you listen to uh, what would be a good example today is uh, um, the Marvin's Room thing mm -hmm. that Drake did. Mm -hmm. At Marvin's room, concert. he worked on that. I did, yes, he, and he worked at tell, Marvin's tell, room. You know, I, I'm, 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 I'm getting things stacked up on it. But tell how, tell how it got his name. It well, got his name from your studio. That's what happened. I work at, uh, you know, John McClain, mm -hmm. uh, in twelve John, years ago. John. Yeah. If John ever watches this, shout out to you, John. Shout out to John McClain. Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. absolutely. So uh, McClain bought Marvin Gaye's old studio. 
and uh, you know, just it's a, a tribute to it has the finest of the old technology, the finest of the new technology. Uh, but it's like uh, you, you know, you have to be in the President's Club to get in there. You know, mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. just let just anybody in. It's very That's right. limited membership. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. right. So the first night that Drake was in, in Marvin's room, he has 40 just kind of throw up this, uh, this piece of music. And it, again, it, it follows the same principles, like I said, of a ballad. It's like, there's no hi-hats, which Drake hates anyway. He hates hi-hats anyway, so it just worked out. And then it's just this nice, I, 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 I think that ballad, I think that song was pretty influential in, in the rap community. Yeah, it is. But I mean, it's the same principle again. But you do remember who did one of the first hip-hop ballads, right? <laughs> Me? <laughs> uh, when will I see you smile? A Bella DeVoe. Oh. I did a 12 minute remix that got played. Yeah. I can't remember if I did that with Richard and Brett. I hope I didn't. Or I hope I didn't. But anyway, I think I might have so, done that. So finish time. up the Mar Marvin story. So. Oh, so, so yeah, so that was it. Uh, they, they just, uh, 40 played this incredible piece of music, and Drake just was, you know, on a phone conversation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it incorporated the principles you just said, right? Right, exactly. Because, like, again, as Drake is singing, there are no instruments competing frequency-wise with, mm -hmm. with his vocal, right? Mm -hmm. So his vocal, it sits. There's not a whole lot of busyness going on, so you can really understand what he's saying, mm -hmm. and you can get the emotion of what he's saying. Mm -hmm. You know, now, in an up-tempo record, you want drivers, right? You want a motor here, you want things yeah. that are panned out, you know, movement. Mm -hmm. In a ballad, you want to be able to pull you, the people in. It's right. like, you know, it's like you want to get someone's attention. You don't yell, mm -hmm. you whisper. It mm -hmm. brings a man closer, mm -hmm. right? So you just, you know, the, the, the art to the ballad is almost leave out as much music as you can mm -hmm. that you can get away with. Mm -hmm. uh, a tiny change of subject, but when I think of Mickey, I think of uh, Nick Martinelli. Yes. Is he still alive? No, he's not. He passed? He passed. God, what a talent. What a talent. I was talking with my friend Sammy Knox in Atlanta at Arcadia Studios in Atlanta, and uh, Sammy had the opportunity to work with Nick up in uh, Philly. Right. At, uh, what was the name of that studio? You remember? I can't remember. What in Sigma? Sigma, that's what it was. Uh, Man, what, Nick was incredible. Um, what a great student. Love Under New Management. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Golly. That, that'd be a good ballad for people to study. Yes. Um, I just saw Mickey the other night. She had a show at the Catalina. Mm. Wow. Uh, I've become friends with Brandon. Oh, he's, he's amazing, yeah, right? Isn't he very talented? Yeah, I, I, li I like him a lot, too. Um, I don't know if you're proud of this or, or not, but I'm going to bring it up anyway, because I'm very proud of it, because I was a little tiny part of it, but you did probably the biggest selling, longest running major commercial ever, the jingle ever, Always Coca-Cola. Yeah. I mean, that thing ran for seven, eight, ten years, yeah. 170 countries. I know I personally did 800 remixes <laughs> for you. <laughs> I mean, we were mixing in... in uh, Lithuanian, we yes. were mixing in. <laughs> right, right. I mean, and then, and then, and then, uh, country versions, yeah. hip hop yeah, versions. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, yeah. you. Yeah, it was challenging though. It was more than anything else. But what he's talking about is, we, we, we you know, I, I wrote this always Coca Terry and myself. We wrote this always Coca Cola mm -hmm. jingle, and uh, it became the global theme. 170 languages around the world. Mm -hmm. You know, it's huge commercial. So uh, during the Olympics. There were 17 days of Olympics. They want us to do 17 uh, different versions of the jingle to correspond mm. with the Knights of Olympics, track and field, mm -hmm. you know, uh, with equestrian or whatever. Mm -hmm. So it's this guy named uh, Thugwani. Mm. So now I'm doing an inter, you know, you got to, every day you got to do a fresh lyric to match the thing. So how do you, what rhymes with Thugwani? Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, we, so we're in there, and Dave is not kidding. We would literally, we would have to do the jingle, the commercial tonight, and it's airing on the Olympics tonight oh, wow. or first thing in the morning. So we were, it was a we pressure. Like we, we did so wow. many versions of this wow. thing. Wow. And I mean, we had Randy Travis doing country versions. Yeah. We were doing uh, Latin. Uh, you know, it was, it, it was amazing. It was the craziest thing. It, it was one of those things where it's like, 
you know, it's one of these things where you, you spend all this time crafting these ballads and all, and then mm. something you write in like 15 minutes is like, turns into <laughs> it. Right? The, the, Game the, changer. The story on that is that you hadn't completely, you had not completed the lyrics. Right, exactly. And, and so you did like a, like <laughs> Phil Collins did with Susu Studio. You right. just had a la di da di da di da right. uh, and you were expecting to finish it right. after you got it approved. Right. And that became the that became the part that the Coca Cola executives loved. Well, what they said, and it makes sense when you think about it. It's in 170 languages around the world, right? Uh -huh. The common denominator is the do 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 do. Exactly. So you hear chang wing 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 do 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 right? Or it's whatever do 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 whatever. Mm -hmm. And you know you hear that do 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 do. Everybody could do that. Everybody could do 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 do. Herb has a passion to bring. I won't say alternative because they're not alternative, but to expose our audience to multiple ways to earn a living mm -hmm. in this world of, of audio that we that we all love so much and are a part of, and in that spirit, can can you give our audience any advice about the jingle world? Is it is it a pretty tough world? I mean, is it is it a, a viable alternative for for some of the guys in our audience? I mean. We had fun doing that stuff, yes, and I know it was did. lucrative. And yeah, then I did a I did a couple of hundred Budweiser commercials for you too. <laughs> we, did, yeah. we did that and a bunch of <laughs> bunch of stuff too. Yeah. And we had fun. Yes. I mean, yes. Is that, can you well, the, can you impart the, something about that process to our audience well, how to get into it? The beauty of it is, like, we're not watching the charts, right? Right. We're not watching the music charts per se. Mm -hmm. We're just trying to. To, to target something to an audience that has an, authentic, an authenticity to it, right? Mm -hmm. It's funny. Uh, 1989, right, right at the turn of the 90s, yeah, Quincy Jones is on uh, uh, BET, mm -hmm. and they're talking about who were the producers to watch in the 90s and all this other stuff. And Quincy made this really, you know, bold, great s statement. Shout out to Quincy Jones, who's birthday was yesterday. <laughs> I was, was going to say that near the end, but let me bring it up. Right. I love this. I love right. this, what you're about to say. So Quincy goes, well, you know, these guys, uh, John Edelsby and Terry Coffey, they know everything from street music to Stravinsky, mm. right? Mm. So now, in the scope of popular music, how can you show that you know everything from street music to Stravinsky? You can't. Right. We're usually trends. If it's disco, it's disco, yeah. right? Yep. If it's house, it's house. If it's, you know, uh, uh, new Jack Swing, it's New Jack Swing. Music t has a tendency, you know, everything kind of follows the leader and you get st stuck in these pockets. Yeah. Well, with this jingle, we had an opportunity to do classical pieces, mm -hmm. right? And Terry, you know, Terry's a, you know, study, you know, film scoring mm -hmm. at UCLA, mm -hmm. right? So you got a chance to do your classical thing. We're from Chicago, mm -hmm. right? So there was a, 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 a bootlegged Italian 12 inch over in Italy where someone had done a a 12 inch version of the Coca Cola jingle. Because mm, oh, wow. the jingle was so popular. Wow. Right? So they slapped them with a cease and desist and they asked us, well, can you guys do, uh, you know, a house? We're from Chicago. We can't do house music. <laughs> right? right, exactly. <laughs> Don't let this Keith Washington fool you. <laughs> we can get, you know, so right. we did house versions. We're doing Latin versions. We have Randy Travis, country mm -hmm. versions. I mean, so it gave you an opportunity to, in a sense, go from street music to Stravinsky mm -hmm. and, and, and show, you know, what theme on theme and variation, right? Mm -hmm. We took a theme, we did hundreds of variations, and it, it's fun. It's a chance to stretch out. How do you get into that world? That was a very bizarre thing. We were... Not, not how, do you, how did you, but right. how does a person get into that world? Excellent question. Like I said, for us, we were in the first act ever signed to Interscope. Right, the mm -hmm. day that Jimmy Iovine got there, it was his it's John. Called, it was the Truth or something. The yeah, Truth, Truth yeah. Incorporated, right? So it's John McClain, Jimmy Iovine, and us, and Ted Fields. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to do, uh, you know, our, our our band thing, right? So we're going around, and of course, because of the John McClains, the Jimmy Iovines, we're in some real high profile, like, like we were managed by Sandy Gallon, right, right. who was managing Michael Jackson at the time, and Dolly Parton, and right. Neil Diamond, you know. Mm -hmm. And so we're shopping for agents, because you know, in California to work, you need an agency. That's right, managers can't do it. So of course, we have William Morris, and I see him and everything, but then we get to CAA, mm -hmm. Mike Ovitz, who was the most powerful man on planet Earth at that time, mm -hmm. you know, with the package deal. Mm -hmm. We had everybody from Kevin Cosner and Streisand, Sloan, everybody. So what happens was one of his buddies from college, this guy named Peter Seeley, was the head 
at Coke. Mm. Pepsi was kind of getting gaining on the numbers wise. So he goes to his buddy Mike, what do we what do I do? Mike goes, you know, well, I have some of my clients take a stab at your jingle. Mm -hmm. I mean at, at your campaign. So you're like Rob Reiner and these guys directing commercials. And then he put his music department on it. So one of the, the ways they were saying, you know, you should come over here with us to CAA, uh, one of the things we're doing, which you might be, may not be interested in, we're doing this Coca-Cola campaign. And he had all of his, right, like, you know, he had like Luther and Barry Manilow, mm -hmm. like start out writing jingles, like a good neighbor, State Farm is there and all this kind good of stuff. Bomb. Dallas Austin, Prince had a really good one, but it was uh, Coca-Cola in your face. Right, and I don't think they just got the in, you're in the face part, right? Mm -hmm. So, but you know, uh, we get the gig, of course. Uh, the call, and I'm thinking, with all this competition, we may be facing all these guys. What are the chances? You know, I'm just, just write something, you know, whatever it is, beads, it's always a drum, wherever there's fun, it's called, called do, 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 always go call, you know, right? Uh -huh. it, if they like it, I'll write some real words, but, you know, like, just, just do something quick so we can get in. Like right. I said, literally, like, 15 minutes. We just need to get in there. Right. So they come back and they go, hey, we love it. Right? So then you're going, wow. Okay, well, let me write some real lyrics. They're going, no, 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 no. Just like it is. The yeah. do-do-do-do-do's. That's the uh, <laughs> That's what we, what yeah. we want, yeah. right? Yeah. Now, I come from Chicago, which is the jingle capital of the world. Right? I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. Chicago is mm -hmm. the place. Mm -hmm. Right? So, in Chicago, there are lots of, um, you know, jingle houses, you know, and you, you, you go, you submit. If you can find out what campaigns or whatever they're doing, mm -hmm. you can go and, you know, you submit, you know, for the works. What happens with jingles is it's not so much about the upfront money as the yeah. residuals. Yes, yeah, that's right. That's right. Right? Mm -hmm. You want to be on those contracts because every time that thing plays, you get paid. Mm -hmm. And it's about media buys, you know, where you, instead of trying to do, you know, record company, right? Typical recording contract. Uh, maybe not so much now with the digital world, but back in the day, you have, you know, a reserve against returns. They ship out a certain amount of units. Mm -hmm. It stays out there for the popularity of the record. When the record is no longer popular, they ship those back. Right. So they hold a percentage of your money back mm -hmm. as a reserve against returns, mm -hmm. right? There's free goods, promotional yeah. items, yeah, with the, goods. Yeah, mm -hmm. the hole punched in the record, or sometimes they Absolutely. do cleans Art, where there are promotional records that aren't necessarily goods. punched, but That's you sure. get stuff back. That's with sure. commercials, there is a sheet, a schedule of media buys. They purchased this to play it X amount of times on this radio station, on these TV stations, so your money is very traceable. Mm -hmm. It's very easy to find. You know what I mean? You mm -hmm. don't really need to do an accounting. Do you still get money from the Always Coca Cola yeah, stuff? Believe it or not. Wow. What's today? Today's. I should know what today's my birthday. I should know what today is. Today's your birthday. Today's my birthday. Oh, happy birthday. You know, Will I am. Today's Will I am. Will I am. How be doing? Arif Martin, rest in peace. And John oh, Nettlesby. And Sly Stone. Wow. No joke. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Oh, cool. So royalties come out on the 23rd. What's funny, of course, is it doesn't play as much here in the States, very spark, but foreign royalties are nice. The domestic, domestic ones have mm. dwindled a little bit, but the foreign royalties are still, it's still playing in Lithuania. Mm -hmm. <laughs> before, Herb, Herb has a couple of questions for you, but before, um, can I tell the story of how, how we met, how oh, we got going out here? <laughs> well, I, I've been from the South, Herb. I was not unaccustomed to having my house be on wheels, so it wasn't a far stretch that I was in my car, and I was looking for a place to live. John and Terry had come from Chicago. They were looking for a place to live. I was living in my car. Our dear, dear friend, Karen Mayo, who you guys have played in a band with in yes. Chicago, my friend uh, in Cameo, the sax player, was, uh, was dating Karen. He said, you ought to give this girl a call. Maybe you can stay with her. So I called Karen. Karen says, oh, Karen's a sweetheart, by the way. She says, yeah, come on, you can stay here. I've got an empty bedroom. So then John and Terry call, uh, the room's <laughs> taken. So they, they actually would get on a bus. This is a true story, John. True story. They would actually get on a bus in the evening, go to the back, sleep, and as the bus made its rounds, then they'd wake up, then they'd go hit all the record companies like I was doing, and, 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 and that's how we met. Yeah. Yeah, the Laser. number two. The number two bus goes from downtown L.A. 
all the way out to Venice Beach. Mm. Right? It's a good sleep. It's a good <laughs> sleep. It's a good sleep. <laughs> it's a good sleep. <laughs> oh, okay. not, the, not the limited, but the, the, the actual uh -huh. two funds. You got to get as many stops, stops as you can. Yes. That's right. So it's stopping all those stops. Oh, By the time you funny. get to the beach and you act like, oh, I missed my stop, then you got to go all oh, That's right. But you know what, John? Uh, I, I, I brought this up not so our audience would think that we were anything special because we weren't. We didn't know we were doing anything hardship wise it was just fun to be in LA right. fun to be close to music right and we were at a point in our lives where just being here made all, I, I don't remember those as bad days right. you know no, they were no. they were they it was were exciting because of the opportunities right. like look i met john mclean at the height of of he had he had signed janet jackson at a and back in the a &M, yeah. a &M days right i met john mclean in westwood going to a falafel going mm. to get some falafels. He was sick as a dog, right? He wouldn't really want to be out. He didn't really talk to people that much. So he's going out to me and me falafels in Westwood. I recognize him from the one magazine article sure, that he's done. Right, 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 right. And I go and, and I see him. Now imagine this. I've known John McClain almost 30 years now, right? He's the founder of Interscope. He's, uh, he's you know, like I said, he's one of Janet Jackson. Um, uh, DreamWorks with Flo with Tree and all the Ron Isley. I just did a Ron Isley record uh, a few years back with my good friend Greg Curtis. Shout out to Greg Curtis. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. I just talked to uh, Rooster about Greg on the way over here. Yeah. Right? Greg's working with Polo. Yeah. Yes, he is in Atlanta. Right? Yeah. I just spoke to Greg yesterday. Mm -hmm. So, Greg and I did a Ron Isley, which is something that John had signed over at uh, DreamWorks, right? Um, you know, uh, Weeby Clubbing with Ice Cube or. Uh, you know, the Player Club soundtrack, or um, you know, I any number of things. John's the person that signed Dr. Dre, the Death Row thing right. at Interscope, or right. whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, any number of things. Well, I met this guy just walking down the street, you know, in Westwood. And, and you bum rushed him. And a guy who, trust me, you could get the president on the phone easier Easy. than mm -hmm. you can get John McClain on mm -hmm. the phone, mm -hmm. right? That's but true. because. We're in L.A., enough due diligence to actually, like I said, the one picture that's exist in existence of this guy. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, this is guy. He's the executive of Michael Jackson's estate. Find a picture of him right. on the internet well, not, if you can. You can. Right? Right. He's that kind of a guy. So, uh, you know, just being here afforded an opportunity to interface with someone that you could and, never... And not only that, we believed that those chance encounters would happen. So we would right. move here, right? Exactly. From other cities, well, if you and put yourself in that position. If you substitute the name Herb Trowe for John McLean, that's my story. I met Herb that way. But you know, we all came that way. Right. But 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 to move it forward, because I alluded in the opening to something that you said at an interesting intersection. That relationship with John, and you know, I know John, and John is only going to afford his trust to a few people. You, you, you're going to earn that trust. <laughs> you're going, Daily. Oh, absolutely, <laughs> hourly. Absolutely. Um, yes. But it all has to do with his standards of excellence and so on and so forth, which was, which was always nice to see once you, once you dealt with it. So you're now sitting at a position in, with the world's greatest artist, mm -hmm. certainly one of the two greatest artists in the world, where you sit at a chair where not only some of the business aspects of what mm -hmm. goes on and all that range of creativity. So from records that you're doing or involved with doing, the Cirque du Soleil show that you're involved in doing, movies, and also lots of deals that have technological challenges that may not come to fruition, mm -hmm. but you have to think about. From all your skill sets, did mm -hmm. that get you ready for this? And then how do you, do you apply them? Because that's about as broad as it gets, and that's about as unique a, set, a seat yeah. that exists in the world for audio engineering, right? right? Absolutely. Um, yeah. So, 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 what are the challenges? What does it keep you? Do you have to keep your chops up? What? How do you apply them? Is it different for each thing? Well, I mean, okay. So let's think about that. a lot of the stuff that is now uh, being, let's say, reissued from Michael's catalog. Yeah. Is things that were originally recorded on a medium that is not as popular anymore. Right. 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 So you have these two-inch tapes, or early Sony digital, uh, you know. Recordings, yeah. right? The thirty-three forty-eight that aren't as popular anymore. So you have to find working machines to do transfers, wow. and the transfers have to be meticulous. Because you remember, we're talking about Michael Jackson, who was an absolute perfectionist. Yes, 
Right. Yep. Absolute perfectionist. So, you know, it, it's just about sonic integrity mm -hmm. to translate through whatever medium we're, we're dealing with today. Right. And, and it's hours and hours and hours of information. Michael's tape budget, Michael's tape budget mm -hmm. was m more than double most people's recording I budgets. Heard, I heard like on, no uh, joke. on Bad, it was like a million dollars just for tape. Tape. Just, just for, tape. for tape. Just the cost of tape. Tape. Wow. Okay, so now this year, I don't know if I'm going to be allowed to say, but this year is that marks the 25th anniversary of the Bad album. Mm -hmm. Right, so this year there will be a 25th anniversary edition Bad record that's mm -hmm. coming out, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at libraries of tape that are bigger than this room. Wow. Wow. Right? And of course, the one song we're looking for is <laughs> the not there. bottom of that. Right, thing. exactly. In the back <laughs> row of the corner. Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, <laughs> so you got to pull that out and just, you know, really listen, mm -hmm. right? Because, I mean, think of all the technologies that have come in the time mm -hmm. Dolby. Mm -hmm. Right, so you had your ear, you had to hear these were these things encoded with Dolby. Do we need to decode them now? Or they've done, you know, Studer, uh, you know, those old Scully 16, uh, you know, two inch, right, 16 track, two inch tapes or whatever, you know. So what you're listening for from a sonic perspective is not just the changes in fidelity, mm -hmm. you know, from mm -hmm. from a, a fidelity standpoint, but would that sound be indigenous of that recording format? Or are we looking, or is this a slave or a copy of something, mm -hmm. and we have to find the original original, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because Bruce Sweetine, right, mm -hmm. as you saw from your show, he's, mm -hmm. a, he's a freak for, these, for the transients, right, for mm -hmm. maintaining the transients. So we're at a time when it's not in the digital world where everything can just be played over and over and over and over again. You mm -hmm. run something across that tape head, every time it goes across that tape head, you're losing some mm -hmm. oxide, right? Right, mm -hmm. right? So Sweetine had a meticulous system of master, slave, slave from slave, slave from slave of slave, mm. you know what I mean, mm. right? Mm. Just so that when he got through perfecting what he was doing, then he could slap on that original tape and the transients had mm. been maintained, right? Wow. So it's, you know, they, they, Michael had two active archivists mm -hmm. functioning to archive that information. And Jeez. you have to bring it back, and you know, and then, uh, and then wow. you have to... John, I'm going to stop you because we're getting a little short on time. Right. I know you spent a lot of time uh, recording vocals with Michael. Mm -hmm. what, was your mic, what was your mic path chain, and what mic did you use on, uh, uh, when you recorded him? Okay, now this is the funniest thing in the world. Well, don't tell me an SM57. Not an SM57. Michael, Luther, and Mariah, when they all came to Marvin's, they all brought a Sony C800. Their, their own. Not that we didn't already have four of them at Marvin's, but they brought that. that and I, I used to think they're all Sony artists. Ooh, <laughs> Some kind right, of conspiracy. Right? right, right, right. <laughs> right? Uh -huh. Some kind of conspiracy. Right. Mary J. Blige, Drake, Yolanda Adams, right? Faith Evans. Mm. That Sony, for some reason, happens to be just that that mic. I don't know if it's just the the. It has a, a modern sound. It has a it. modern sound to it. Right? What mic pre did you use? Ten seventy three. And, and what did you use the BAE one or a, a real? No, no, a real mm -hmm. ten. John's got probably the gazillion beefs in there. Mm -hmm. And then and then what compressor did you compress going to, to the? I would use LA two A sometimes, but you know, as well as anyone. A really great singer is so sensitive to compression, they don't want to hear it. The song that you and I mixed, uh, did the remix of yeah. Hollywood Tonight. Did, right. did you record that vocal? I did. That was a good. That, that was a, the 800. That, that was. Yeah. That 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 was a uh, that was a really well recorded vocal. Well, yeah. con continue on that theme because we're, we're running out of time. So why don't we why don't we tee up Batter's Box and can I ask one more question? Yeah, you can. Then Just give me on. one 30 second anecdote that, that, that our audience would find fascinating about Michael. Okay, and, and here's, yeah. here's the interesting thing about Michael. Michael, because he's been recording since he was like nine years old, mm -hmm. right? He knows everything about how to record his vocal, mm -hmm. right? So like there's baffles up, right? So some of them you'd have, you know, a, a cover over, a carpet over them for a certain sound. 
other times he would take the cloth off of him if he wanted a reflective sound. Who was uh, that astute? Dave. He would open the baffles up, turn around and sing backwards, right? Wow. So, this is the craziest thing. He wanted to record hand claps, right? So we all know. Michael hated necessarily artificial reverbs. His right? timing was immaculate. Right? So he hated his artificial reverbs. So he goes into the bathroom to record the hand claps. So the mic is facing the wall. He's facing the other wall to get the complete mm -hmm. sound, right? He says to me, hey, now, I'm not hearing what I'm expecting to hear in these headphones. Right? I'm going, that's curious. Mm. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, he's not just recording hand claps in the bathroom because he knows they sound better in there. He's listening. Turns out, I didn't have the mic in Omni. Uh, right? Mm. So it's cardioid. Right? So it's only picking up a very specific reflection. He wants the full, re and he knew it in mm -hmm. the headphones. Mm -hmm. Not coming in the control room listening. He knew what he was listening for wow. in the room. In the headphone, I mean, he is like a recording wizard. He knew mm -hmm. everything about the snare sound. Okay, I, I want to get this this trumpet case, and I'm gonna smack it with this belt buckle, right now. And I need you to line this thing up, right, so that it doesn't hit exactly with the snare. I just want to get the transient of the belt buckle hitting the case and the body of, I mean, he was just, he was a, a, a true recording wizard. And he, he, he enjoyed it too. He, oh, of course, it was, because he always wanted mm -hmm. to sound different from everybody else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So he would do just crazy techniques. Like mm -hmm. the average person, like you're recording on a microphone, we're telling him, hey, don't snap fingers and all this other stuff. We built a platform for him in Marvin's, a, a wooden platform to accentuate the snaps, the claps, the feet, stumps, yeah. the beatbox. He beatboxing on ballads. Mm -hmm. He's beatboxing on everything. When, when, when we had the, the song I mixed with you, solo and Herb, you, 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 you heard, heard all this stuff, and yeah. then in the track, it just melts yes. right into the track. Yes, yes, you ready for this? Absolutely. You know the, you know the routine, my I friend. Do. I do. And Herb is going to grade you. He's harsh, harsh. <laughs> Herb has yet to give a perfect score. Let's see well, how keep you in can I'm an engineer from a producer's perspective. No question I'm not about a, it. I'm not no a question. purist. Which is perfect. That's Everything perfect. I really learned about engineering, I learned from Dave well, Pizzo. I think, I, you're the perfect guy because you use tons of plugins. You got all the gear at Marvin. So yeah, when, you, when you name a piece of gear, it's going to have a little bit of weight. Lead yeah. vocals. Lead vocals. Uh, again, Sony C800, 1073, CL1B. Uh, background vocals. Background vocals, uh, 87. Okay. Yeah. Give me more gear than mics. Okay. Because most of my guys can't afford those mics. All right. Okay. Acoustic you. guitar. Acoustic guitar. You know the little ribbon mics. <laughs> <laughs> you go into the microphone. Uh, so uh, acoustic guitar to me is really about how it sits in the mix, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, the 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 most important way to to make an acoustic guitar stand out to me is to record. Instead of having a stereo recording, two mono recordings of the guy playing the thing and panning them out to the sides, get the bottom out of them, you know, roll off the bottom end so that they just sit, you know, mm. in the corner, but not the exact same performance delayed with two separate performances. Best rap, rap lead vocal. Don't tell me CS 800. <laughs> <laughs> 80. What's the sure the, the sure mic that they use? The mic that gets SM7. an SM7. What, what compressor do you like on rap vocals? On rap vocals, Arvox. Oh, cool. A piano, a real piano. Real piano. No, no. Let's make it. Let's make it synth piano. Synth, synth piano. Synth piano. You know what I, I, I what I find a lot is that all of the compression and, and stuff, because the synth pianos, when you're programming them, you can get them to kind of sit the way you want them. So like gates and compressors are not as, mm -hmm. uh, you, I don't use them as much as we used to back in the days, mm -hmm. but uh, a synth piano, a nice little top end, so GML, oh. the GML uh, EQ. MDW? Yeah. Uh, synth strings. Same thing, the GML. Or, the, or actually, the uh, Sonics, the uh, Sony Oxford oh, yeah. with the GML option. Oh, that's okay. the one that sells. I don't have that. You like that? I, I, I mean, Dave, I mean, you know what's funny? I like the GML, probably the sound of it better, 
but the interface is so it's weird. Yeah, that I use this this the Sonics because with the Gmail option mm. because I, I I know how to use it because I, I'm you know. Like I said, more visual than anything. Yeah, yeah. So being able to see what the plugin is doing, which I think is, is mm. probably a real consequence of us mixing in the Okay, John, we've got to keep this rolling. Yeah. Synth bass. Synth bass. Trillion. Trillion. The Trillion, the plugin. Oh, wow. I hadn't thought about that. Yeah. Um, synth pads. Synth pads. Omnisphere. <laughs> you know, I mean, I prefer. That Oberheim or OB, OB8, or, mm -hmm. that, or even just the Matrix 1000, mm -hmm. but you know, because real pad, nothing like real synth pad pads. But in the box, that Omnisphere is probably the greatest thing since sliced bread. Mm -hmm. And last but not least, Stereo Bus. Stereo Bus L2. Yeah. <laughs> How can use, you go wrong? I use it every day, yeah. all day. Do you, ever, right. do you use, ever use L2 inside, inside, like on an individual track? I, L1. I'd use L1 like that. Yeah. I, 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 I should try. We should try L2. I wonder what it would do. Yeah, I wonder. Yeah, but you know, it's got that little delay in it, right? Well, yeah. it's got delay compensation. But I'll tell yeah. you, L2, Arvox, all day, every day, every project, everything. Are you are you using nine yet with waves? I'm using. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Drew, let's see what you got in the corner office. You got anything in the corner I office? I do. Works? I do. Like a question from Urban Jack. Um, <coughs> excuse me. How about asking what his favorite software for making beats is? Is he working mostly in the box nowadays? Talk about you, John. Okay. Unfortunately, I'm a, I'm a, I'm still a, a victim of you know when I grew up and what I think sounds the fattest in the world is this 4 at that F16. There is nothing like it anywhere in the world, mm -hmm. and the swing, the feel still of a Lin 9000, the mm -hmm. feel of mm -hmm. it. Uh, Shout out to Ben and Bruce. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Bruce Forehead, you know, changed my life. And then I have, of course, some Dave Pensato samples from a, that I got from a zip disk from him oh, from wow. that was like 10 years, 15 years 10, ago. 10, 15 years ago. And still to this day, nothing sits like those sounds. I know that Forehead. Two more questions, Ru. Cool, cool. All right. Um, from Dubit Productions, what is the best way to promote yourself through today's media outlets? Thanks for both of you guys. For everybody, I guess at the same time. I think, yeah, Herb would probably be more student. Uh, what's the best way to promote yourself through today's media outlets? Yeah, media outlets. Um, first of all, engage. So make sure you're on all the platforms. Do it with consistency because you can't do it and back away it and do it again. Um, and then what you're trying to do is I, make yourself singular by your work. So if you're just doing what everybody else is doing, you're going to have that kind of reaction. So you try to figure out how to define yourself so you stand out a little bit. That, that's kind of really broad, but given the time we have, that, that's what I would suggest you do. And some people might not have anything to promote. <laughs> right. well, 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 the issue sometimes in promoting yourself is just talking about your aspirations. Sometimes right. that's what, see, where a lot of people get wrong is that they think that just being there gets results. And I mm -hmm. tell people all the time, the internet doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. You can get on, so in order to be in the game, you gotta be in the game how you define yourself is a whole other science. Yeah. So everybody can get on, which is what you see, but to make a definition is a different so thing. So say that again, that was, that was kind of genius. The, the, the first part about, oh, I, I forgot what you said, but you said part of, part of it is just being on the internet talking about yourself, how'd you well, say it? Well, no, what I'm saying is everybody, the internet allows everybody to get on, but a lot of people expect just being on will get you results. Being on is just getting inside the club. In order to get the girl, you got to do something to right. define yourself right. to get the girl. So a lot of people are on and they get confused because they don't get, they don't, something doesn't happen for them. And you have to get into, you got, the bottom line is to make it simple, you're going into a huge ecosystem with a lot of people in it. Everybody that has a computer can get in it. How do you get in that ecosystem, ecosystem and then make yourself stand out somehow? You can't be phony, you're gonna get busted. Mm -hmm. You're gonna have to do something that has some substance to it and it's gonna have to be organic. People are gonna have to believe you and that can take time to do. The internet is about a lot of work and consistency. If you don't give it that, it's not gonna give you anything back. And also too, remember, no matter how great you think you are, there's some video on YouTube with a little cat that got 20 million views to your, <laughs> to your 20,000. All right, cool. What got, does that tell you? I got one more. Uh, I got an ethics question from Roland Good Peterson. Answer, huh? 
Question for Dave and guests. Do you have any ethical standards when you are mixing songs with rude words? Or is it, or is it just money? Uh, we know that many of the top songs kids listen to, they shape our future. Um, yeah, there's, there's, there's uh, just basic cuss words don't bother me too much in today's climate. Things were different 20 years ago. There's certain words 20 years ago you didn't say that now are so common. You just, I'm over here looking at Drew like everybody can know that I'm looking at Drew. <laughs> uh, but uh, there, there's some subjects and some, some things that I still would shy away from. Um, I, 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 I don't quite know why, but there's just some things I just wouldn't do. Well, to, to, to get your answer, let me just say, Wayne, so part of, part of what is fascinating about your seat is that the pressures that you have on in there, in this particular seat, from the broadness of the content, film, movies, television, theater shows, all kinds of stuff, and then just the pressure of dealing with a legacy, a family, mm -hmm. expectations of audience, mm -hmm the global side of it, you have to apply ethics in every decision you make. Wouldn't Absolutely. that be correct? Absolutely. Because you have a brand that is so universally yeah. right, accepted, right? Like you could take the, the thuggiest thug in the hood, the preppiest kid in, in, you know, in the Hamptons, yep. in the Poconos, and they're all wearing that sequin glove and that red jacket, yep. right? Yep. Mm -hmm. So you have a brand that is transcendent Mm -hmm. of, of gender, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. nationality, Class. They're, they're in Israel, That's right. you know what I mean, they're in, you know, Lithuania, mm -hmm. right? So you have to have a brand that's, that has a certain integrity to the mm -hmm. brand. Mm -hmm. So when you start bringing a, a lot of the, 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 the negativity and the curse words, as a brand, you know, you shy away from that. Mm -hmm. Which is whether it's words or music choices right. or yeah. sonic integrity right. or yeah, you gotta, you project gotta, choices. Yeah, right. Well, shout out to you, man. Give Thank give you. a shout to our buddy John McClain. I shall. And when are we gonna do another mix fest? <laughs> oh, you were at the last one. Did you have a good time? I had an incredible time. I had oh, cool. a blast. I yeah, heard. Well, we're time. gonna do another mix fest. Yeah, it's 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 in it's in my head. We're, we we want to we we keep wanting to build this thing bigger. So we're 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 it's coming up. It's I, I'm telling you, look, the Q and A, the Q and A aspect mm -hmm. of the the mix fest mm -hmm. is something that okay, yeah, every like you said, I've shown you guys how to com EQ and compress a kick drum mm -hmm. for 50 weeks. Anybody got any questions? Yeah, <laughs> you got to shut them down, right? Yeah, because absolutely. it's the ability to. I've been at home struggling with. DSers and the whole concept of parallel compression mm -hmm. for 40 episodes. I have a very specific question I'd like to be able to ask to mm -hmm. the greatest mix engineers uh -huh. that ever walked the planet, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So you're going, hey, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. How can, because you know, not everybody is going to have the same access, right? Also, too, our, 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 our profession is a solo sport inside right. a cave, yes. and to get a Several hundred of us in a room yeah, together. That was just the fun. Energy was comparing it notes, was. you know. It was. Oh, it said a lot to our. It said a lot about our audience. I mean, the, yeah, the participation. So, so we got a lot of stuff coming. You were there. What was cool is that we had people there who were newbies. We had veterans like yourself. We had educators. And, and to your point, it was a chance to bring the community together in a way where we could learn thing. stuff yeah. and rock star it a little bit yeah, and yeah, do some show something. business yeah, stuff yeah, and sure. give people access. So we're, we're going to, you know, we like to perfect stuff. So yeah. we're, it's, in, it's in the hopper. Nice. We gave away thousands of dollars. We gave a lot. Our stuff. sponsors were incredible. We incredible. gave a lot of stuff. And we're going to keep ratcheting that up. Brother man. Yes, sir. I was you, still waiting. No, no, this is just the first in the sequence. You know, I always say it every show, so yeah, this is number let's one. Let's do a whole show on, you're, on, you're coming on the back. Michael thing, because I find that so You're coming back. Or... Dave, anytime, like I said, everything I've learned. Tell, got, tell, John, got... tell John we're going to go behind the velvet rope <laughs> and come, come to Marvin's room. We will not just close the location. Yeah, we'll keep is. all the secrets and I'll, shoot I'll something show from you there. Guys some. Herb does this every show. He does this particular fold. Or and, if there's any psychiatrist in the audience, I'd like to know what the hell this means. And you know what? They find that so interesting. I do. <laughs> I, okay. We need to wrap I'll up. Take, I'll take go. the challenge. I'll tell you something that's interesting. I'm going to give you an example of, of something that I turned down because of the lyrics. I, I was given a song to mix, and it was essentially a diss by a girlfriend of a major artist, and the stuff just wasn't true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, 
the, 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 the label that brought me this was somebody that I, I worked a lot for, so I was jeopardizing a, a good bit of my income, but, and I didn't even mix for this artist that I was, but I just didn't feel like, like it was appropriate, nor did I think it was right. So that's an example of, of yeah, I think sometimes you just have to apply a, a little bit of judgment. But John, I'm telling you, this is, uh, I've said this before, I haven't had this much fun since the pigs ate my little brother. <laughs> I really appreciate you. <laughs> what? No, I was there when that happened. I, I, I was sad then, but now I'm, I'm, I understand how, how <laughs> it's such a good time. <laughs> Say good night. <laughs> Man, guys, thanks for allowing us to come and hang with you for a while. We had a ball, and we'll see you next week.